Morning, everybody. Why don't you join me in a word of prayer? Father, uh, we want to hear you speak to us today. We have no right to hear you, but by the mercy you've shown us, the grace you've shown us in your Son, you invite us close. And we pray now, Lord, that we will avail ourselves, that we will have ears to hear, and that we will be changed by what it is you have to say to us. So please, Lord, will you be speaking in the power of your Spirit through your Word and uh, by the saving sacrifice of your Son. Amen. Rest is a curious thing. It seems the harder we try to get it, the more it evades us. When we are working, all we want in life is a little time at home with the family. Now that we are at home with the family all the time, we couldn't be more restless. You wait all year to go home to Limpopo in December or to the beach, the beachfront at Derbs, to see the extended family. But by the beginning of January, you are gagging to get back to work for a little bit of rest. It's a strange thing, rest. For some, rest is a weekend of loud music and partying. For others, rest is a silent retreat. For some, it's just pure adrenaline. For others, it's a hot bath and a good novel. We look for rest all over the place. We will try anything, everything. We think the rich and famous have a wonderful life. All that rest. But you have to ask, why do they keep killing themselves? If they're so rested and relaxed, why do they keep turning up as another tragic celebrity obituary? So it seems there is no rest in work, but there's no rest in leisure either. The wise man in Ecclesiastes picks up on this theme. He describes work like this. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, a striving after the wind. And then later on, he says the following. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There's no rest in work. All my work was vanity and a striving after the wind. There's no rest in leisure. The full stomach of the rich man will not let him sleep. Where then is the rest? Our passage this morning is inviting us to enter into rest. And it's going to tell us what rest is. And how we get it. But first let's just follow the logic of the argument. The writer to the Hebrews makes his basic point in verses 1, 2 and 11. So you can look there and see his basic point. The good news, this is it. The good news of a promised rest came to Israel. They didn't combine that good news with faith. And therefore they didn't enter into that rest. The same good news came to the Hebrews. They didn't combine that good news with faith. Well, that was the warning. They must combine it with faith, or they too will not enter the rest. That is the warning the writer to the Hebrews is giving his people. The same good news comes to us. We must combine it with faith, or we will not enter into his rest. That's the main idea. And once again, it comes to us in the form of a warning, as it so often does in the book of Hebrews. The warning is in verse 1. Let us fear lest any of you fail to reach this rest. Just an aside, remember, we have to remember the warnings are not there to rob you of your assurance or to make you doubt your salvation. They are one of the many, many means that God uses to keep us, to keep us going to the end. And that's why we need to hear them and we need to take them seriously. We need to combine them with faith. When the writer has once again invited his readers into this rest, he then goes on a little tour of rest in the Bible. So he hits all the high water marks. He starts in Genesis. That's uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken 
of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. The point that the writer is making is that the offer of rest has been available right from the very beginning of creation. But humanity has consistently rejected this offer. And with a hard heart, we have refused to combine it with faith. The writer reminds his reader that the same was true of the Israelites under Moses. And so they did not enter his rest. They died in the wilderness. Their bodies fell in the desert. And yet the promise still stands. We read about it centuries later in Psalm 95, where God invites his people to enter into rest today, as long as it is called today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, someone might have argued But the Israelites did enter into God's rest under Joshua. And so we have verse 8, because the writer anticipates this argument, we have verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Even though they did enter into the land under Joshua, they didn't enter into God's rest. And we know this to be true. How do we know? Well, what comes after the book of Joshua in the Bible? It's the book of Judges. Now, we've recently done a series in Judges, I think in the last 18 months or so. We wouldn't, those of you who were with us for that series, we would not describe what goes on in the book of Judges with the word rest. That's not the word we would use. We wouldn't use the word faith either. Entering into the land clearly did not guarantee entering into God's rest. And so the invitation stood the promise was not yet fulfilled. That's why, verse 8, God could speak of it later on through David in Psalm 95. So this is the flow of the argument. I hope you've been with me. The good news of an invitation into God's rest has been proclaimed since the creation of the world, since the very beginning. But people have failed, consistently failed, to combine that promise with faith. Israel under Moses failed. Israel under Joshua failed. Israel under David failed. In every generation, God was still inviting them into rest and warning them not to harden their hearts. The conclusion the writer wants his readers to draw is that the invitation and the warning still stand today, as long as it is called today. His original readers had to combine the promise with faith, and so do we. And because in these last days God has spoken by his Son, our faith is to be in Christ. Where Moses and Joshua failed, Christ is the one who will give us true and lasting rest. Jesus is better. And the Jesus and the rest that Jesus offers is better. Two questions we want to answer, two very practical questions. What is this rest and how do we enter into it? What is rest? We've already made the point that it is part of the universal human condition to look for rest, to pursue rest, and so far it has evaded us. You look at the world today. Just consider the world outside your living room. And then consider your own heart at times. It's hardly a picture of rest, is it? And yet, we all know we want it. We all know that we need it. We are trying everything we can think of. We are swallowing and spending and working and playing and exercising and protesting all toward the goal of rest. But it just won't come. And when it does come, it just won't last. Economists call this, they actually have a name for it, the fact that when rest arrives, it just won't last. They call this the law of diminishing marginal utility. The more you consume of anything, 
the less it satisfies. So this block of chocolate, while it gives me some satisfaction, gives me slightly less satisfaction than the previous one. Initially, if we are enjoying rest, it might feel like rest. But the further you go in whatever it is that is offering you rest, the further you go, the less it satisfies. Until what once gave you rest now leaves you restless. We don't know anything. We don't know of anything that defies the law of diminishing marginal utility. We haven't found it yet. That's the human condition. Thanks be to God that he doesn't leave us as we are. That he speaks to us and changes us through his word. Somewhere he has spoken of the seventh day like this. That somewhere is in Genesis. Genesis 1 ends with these words. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis chapter 2 opens like this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God rests. That rest is a divine mystery. But we do need to try and understand what it means because we are made in God's image. And so our rest will have something to do with God's rest. Our rest will re relate by some analogy to God's rest. What does it mean to say that God rests? It can't mean that he's tired or exhausted or spent. God is almighty. There is no end to his power. He is infinite in power. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He only had to speak and the universe came into existence. Rest can't mean that he's tired. What does it say? Genesis 1 and 2. It says he saw what he had made and it was very good. It says he finished his work and so he rested. That word finished in the original is a clue for us. It can have the sense of everything coming together for an intended purpose. It seems the purpose of creation was for God to enjoy what he had made. That's what the language of blessing and holy and very good points us to. The language we read of in the end of Genesis chapter 1, at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, blessing, holy, very good. It's pointing us to the fact that the purpose of creation was for God to enjoy what he'd made. And that was his rest. The mirror image of God's rest would be for us to cease from our work and enjoy our creator. If that's true, if that's what rest is, well then it's no surprise that Moses was promised rest when he led the people out of Egypt. It's no surprise that the Sabbath became the symbol of the whole Sinai covenant or that God calls the promised land the land of rest. It's no surprise that the gift David gave to his people is called rest. It's no surprise that Solomon was known as the man of rest or that the temple was labeled the resting place of God. Nor is it surprising that when the prophets wanted to speak a word of judgment on Israel, they spoke about the loss of rest. Rest at its heart is about our relationship with God. That's what the Sabbath the rest of Sabbath and promised land and temple are pointing us to. It's about putting aside all distraction, all anxiety, and acknowledging our dependence on our Creator, our Provider, our Redeemer, delighting in Him. That's rest. There's rest and there's work. God works and so we work. He commanded us to work to exercise dominion over creation. 
But that work has a purpose and a goal, to delight in the Creator. If we don't cease from our work, if we don't lift our eyes to worship the Creator, we start to live under the illusion that we exist, we only exist, in and for creation. That the horizontal relationships are all that matter. That there is no vertical. That we are somehow independent. That is why our work and our rest cannot give us rest. Because true rest is only found in delighting in God. In being utterly satisfied in Him. The thing you've been looking for your whole life, you will only find in him. He alone breaks the law of diminishing marginal utility. The more you have of him, the more satisfied you will be in him. If that's rest, how do we get it? Well, before we answer that question, we need to pay some attention to the timeline presented here in Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 3, just have a look there, it's clear that those who have already believed have entered into God's rest. In verse 9, there is still a rest celebration, a Sabbath rest for the people of God to come. In verse 10, it says, let us strive to enter that rest. So in the past, we entered into God's rest. In the future, we will enter into God's rest. In the present, we must strive to enter into God's rest. We must work to rest. Sounds confusing. What is this work? What is this striving in the present? We know from the whole of chapter 3 and from this chapter, chapter 4, our striving, our work, our struggle is the struggle against unbelief, against hardness of heart. It is the struggle for faith. Our work is for faith. Now, if that sits slightly awkwardly with you, I'll speak, to, I'll speak more to it in just a moment. Just bear with me. How do we do this work? How can we work for rest. A few tips. God has built rest into the very fabric of creation. Let me ask you a strange question. What is nighttime? We've just read about it in Genesis 1 and 2. The day ended, there was evening, and there was morning. What is this transition? What is nighttime? Why do we move from day into night with such regular orderly intervals. Why did God make it that way? Could it be that he places our world, he regularly places our world into a state of rest to remind us to rest regularly? We need to use that natural physical rest to remind us of the deepest, deeper rest, which is delight in God. So, at the end of every day, at the beginning of each new day, let the natural rhythm, the natural rest, point you to the deeper rest. Mark the change. It's morning. It's evening. Mark the change. Use it for fellowship with God. Every evening, every morning, just be in His presence. Listen for His voice in His Word. Speak to Him in prayer. Worship Him in song. Rest every day rest. Then there is rest every week. You know, since the earliest days of the church, every Sunday has been considered the Lord's day, the Lord's day. That was the day on which Jesus rose to his rest. Christians have always used it to gather and to delight in the Lord, to rest. Now come Sunday, any given Sunday, you may be very tired. It's the end of the work week. It's actually the beginning of the new week. But you've gone Monday through Saturday. You may be exhausted. Going to church or walking down the passage to take your seat on the couch for church at home may feel a lot like work to you at that point in time. That is a sure sign that you need to go. 
you need to go and find rest for your soul. You need to draw refreshment from delighting in God again. You need to draw energy and encouragement from his people. Use Sunday, every Sunday, as a reminder to enter into his rest, week by week. So that's resting every day and resting every week. Finally, we need to rest every year. Use the seasons, use the church calendar, use Christmas and Easter and Advent and Ascension Day and Outreach Week and Mission Week and Celebration Sunday and so on. Use the rhythm of the year to rest in God, to find delight in God. You know, we should delight in the incarnation every single day. But Christmas is a wonderful reminder. We should weep at the foot of the cross and rejoice in the resurrection every single day. But Easter helps to concentrate the heart and the mind. Use, what are we saying? Very simple. Use the rhythm of the day, the rhythm of the week, and the rhythm of the year to help you rest, to help you delight in God. Just a few practical tips. But by now, I'm sure you are very aware that tips and techniques are not enough. They're not enough. Tips and techniques are never going to get you to the Sabbath rest celebration at the end. No amount of spiritual discipline will get you there. Israel didn't just have tips and techniques and disciplines. They had the law of God Almighty. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Such was the hardness of their hearts. Such is the hardness of the human heart. They simply couldn't combine the promise of rest with faith. They couldn't do it. Where are we going to get the faith? How are we any different? Isn't it staggering when you stop to think about it? That Jesus, the son of Joseph, the builder's son, the blue collar man from nowhere, he took God's Old Testament promise of rest onto his own lips. It's staggering if you think about it. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, it's audacious. God has been promising you rest since the beginning of time. I am the one who's going to give it to you. The rest you've been promised, the rest you've been looking for in all the wrong places. I'm here to give it to you. That's what he said. How does he do it? By combining the promise with faith. He is the faithful one. Like Israel, he was in the wilderness. He was tempted, but he didn't harden his heart. He rebuked the tempter. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Like Adam, he was in the garden. He was tempted, but he didn't harden his heart. Instead, he prayed, Lord, let your will be done. He is the one who combines the promise with faith. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Literally, he's the finisher of our faith. Our faith comes together fit for purpose in him. Not only is he faithful, but he also deals with our lack of faith. You know, when God swore, they shall not enter my rest, that word was for Jesus. That wrath was for Jesus. The door to God's rest was slammed in Jesus' face on the cross. Psalm 95 belongs to a collection of psalms called the Royal Psalms because they express Israel's hope for a Messiah who will come and save. And just before it gets to the familiar, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, it says this, O oh, come, let's worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of of his hand. Do you recognize the one who's calling us? God isn't a grumpy schoolmaster looking for someone to punish. He's a shepherd calling to wayward sheep 
out of love and care, out of a deep desire to protect and nurture, a heartbreaking desire to protect and nurture and gather in. He's a good shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd calls to his sheep and he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he goes on to say, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke is a symbol of work. It is the work of resting in Christ. Trusting in his work and not your own. This work is easy. This burden is light. Because he's gentle and humble of heart. And if you let him, he will give you rest for your soul. Do you see why Jesus offers a better rest? Not better by degree. Better by category. Holidays come to an end. Weekends are always, inevitably, I don't need to tell you, followed by Monday. Parties come with a hangover. But the love of a God who lays down his life for you is everything you've ever been looking for. It's the end of all your work to prove yourself worthy to justify your existence. And Jesus has removed every obstacle, even the opposition of your own hard heart, so that now you can delight in God in the same way he delights in you. And that mutual delight will never end. That love relationship is for eternity. And it will never, ever cease to satisfy. Your satisfaction In the Lord, your delight in the Lord will only grow. What is the rest God has promised us? That's the question we we set out to answer. It is the deep soul satisfaction of delighting in God. How do we get it? By trusting in the perfect person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. He was faithful, and he dealt with our faithlessness on the cross. We entered into rest when we first believed. We will enter into an unimaginable rest, soul rest, when we celebrate with Jesus for eternity. Right now, we strive. We work to enter into rest. It's not a work that earns our salvation. Quite the opposite. It's a work to accept that we can never earn our salvation. It's a work to trust in the one who has. Why is it a work? Well, as Herman Bavinck said, there is nothing more difficult for man than to be saved by grace and to live on gifts. Ours is a striving to combine the promise with faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. And so the author to the Hebrews calls to us and he says, Today, if you hear his voice, today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of your faith. Don't put your faith in your faith. Jesus died for your lack of faith, for the fickleness of your faith. Put your faith in in him put your trust in him and we have to do that today we have to put our faith in Jesus today and every day because I wouldn't be preaching this passage if I didn't preach it as a warning it is a warning today the good shepherd is calling you forward on your journey home you hear his voice verses 11 to 13 of chapter 4 Hebrews chapter 4 warn us That his voice, the voice of God, the word of God is living and active. Hearing it today 
is the very thing that will leave you naked and exposed on the day of judgment if you reject it, if you ignore it, if you harden your heart and you will not listen, if you are indifferent. On that day, on that day, the sheep will be gathered around the shepherd for an eternal Sabbath of celebration. But the goats will be left exactly where they are, on the outside, restless wanderers forever. Let's pray. Father, please will you bring our restless wanderings to an end. Help us to come home and delight in you. Today, as we hear your voice, give us ears to hear. Give us soft hearts. Help us to trust in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can only bring this prayer and our plea in his precious name. Amen. Go well, everybody. Have a good week in the Lord, and we'll be back with you next week.